Well, there's not a lot happening this past week, so there are no really timely things to talk about, except, I suppose, the Democratic Convention coming up and the great suspense about who's going to be the Democratic candidate, who will be nominated. Well, there's really no suspense about that. But there's been a lot of talk about the free speech zone that's been set up, a considerable difference, a distance from the convention where people are going to be behind fences and barbed wire to make absolutely sure that they don't disrupt the convention. And there's been a lot of talk about that this past week, but I think the free speech zone will be even more crowded and more of a problem when the Republicans meet in New York in September because there probably aren't that many people who are trying to make a statement against John Kerry. There might be a few posters or placards saying Kerry flip-flops or something of that sort, but nobody is upset at the moment with Kerry for bombing innocent people and taking the country to war based on faulty intelligence or misleading intelligence. That will come next year when, if Kerry is president, that's when people will start complaining about his war-making activities. So there probably will be a lot more excitement when the Republicans meet in September. But meanwhile, I think it's very, very important that you should know that $14.6 million of your tax money is going this week to help defray the costs of the Democratic Convention. Another $14.6 million of your tax money will be spent in September for the Republican Convention. It doesn't cover anywhere near the total cost of the conventions. I understand that the Democratic Convention is supposed to run close to $100 million. But nevertheless, over $14 million is going to come from the general fund. I wonder why we have such a large deficit. You know, it's interesting about the federal financing of campaigns, including the conventions, in that some people think that this really is not tax money because it's voluntary. The money comes from people who put the little check on their 1040 form, their income tax return, saying they want $3 to go. I believe $3 is the amount now. I never pay any attention to it. But I believe it is $3 of their tax money is to go to the fund that finances the elections. And because this is something that not everybody has to check, people get the idea that this is really voluntary money that is going to go to the political campaigns of the Republicans and the Democrats. Not so, obviously. First of all, you are not saying whether or not you want $3 to come out of your pocket for this. What you are saying is, of the hundreds or thousands of dollars that I'm paying to the federal government, I'd like you to use $3 of it for these campaigns rather than using it uh, to send to the dictator in Pakistan or Turkmenistan or someplace else. But, of course, what they will do is they will still send the money to Turkmenistan and Pakistan and just run a larger deficit. But secondly, if they don't get enough money from the $3 supposed contributions, they will go ahead and still spend the same amount of money on the Republican and Democratic campaigns. In other words, they are cooking the books. It is one more example of how the government cheats everybody and uses misleading finance procedures, misleading bookkeeping, such as we discussed here a couple of weeks ago with the deficits. The government supposedly ran surpluses in the late 90s, but they were actually running deficits. The federal debt rose every single year, which is a sure sign that you have spent more money than you took in. All they did, of course, was to take the money from Social Security and replace it with government bonds. The point is that these people are the last people in the world who should be complaining about the financial practices of companies like Enron or anybody else. And I really got a kick this past week when I received a press release from the National Council on Economic Education, some kind of private education foundation, which has just received a grant from the Department of Education, a grant of $1.48 million dollars. And what is this grant for? It is to educate elementary school students throughout the country on personal finance and economics. Isn't that great? Government money is going to be used to educate our children on finance and economics. And to kick this off, they had a big, fat event this past Wednesday in Washington, D.C. It was at the Senate, Russell Senate Office Building. And the speakers on behalf of this program to educate our children on finance and economics The speakers were Senator Daniel Akaka of Hawaii, Senator George Allen of Virginia, Representative Judy Biggert of Illinois, Representative Ruben Hinojosa of Texas. They also had a couple of non-governmental speakers there, including the president of, of course, the National Council on Economic Education. So here we have the politicians who cannot keep their books straight, who cannot, with a straight face, tell us anything about the finances of the federal government, who run spectacular deficits year after year, who use all kinds of shady bookkeeping tricks. These people are going to, in effect, instruct our children 
on how to keep books, how to handle their finances, and how to understand economics. Can you imagine? Once again, I have to say, we have to get government out of the schools. By that, I don't just mean get the federal government out and get the federal government to stop putting money into schools and to stop programs like Head Start and No Child Left Behind and so on, but to get government completely out of schools, to have no government schools whatsoever, because as long as you have government schools, you are going to have programs like the one I just described. As long as you have government schools, you're going to have UN Day, you're going to have very questionable sex education. You are going to have kids coming home and pressuring their parents to recycle. You are going to have schools being used for all sorts of social engineering rather than being used to teach your children how to read, write, understand history and geography, and most of all, how to think logically about the affairs of the day, including what government is, how the free market works, how economics works, how they can take care of their lives, what they must do in order to succeed in life, and all of the things that are really, really important in education. But instead, what we have are little social engineering centers. And you can well imagine what kind of education the children are going to get on finance and economics with this government program. We have, of course, the finance and economics commander-in-chief. His name is George Bush. And, of course, he knows all about these things. And he had a speech just recently where he talked to people about his new Medicare program. And here's one paragraph out of that speech. I think this is classic George W. Bush. Quote, So there's different cards, is what I'm telling you, to meet your needs. And I understand for some that's going to be, it's going to be complicated. And some people just don't want their lives complicated. And, but you've got to know there's help. And just because it may seem complicated, that's not a good, I think people should not use that as an excuse to participate because you're going to find there's good, uh, there's good discounts. There's good savings. 15% on brand name drugs. Minimum. Uh, isn't that right? Is minimum the right word to use? Minimum? End of quote from George W. Bush. Now, do you understand how the Medicare prescription drug program works? Something about cards. The line I really like is, just because it may seem complicated, I think people should not use that as an excuse to participate. In other words, don't participate just because it's complicated. Participate for some other reason than it's complicated. One more example of how the government handles its finances. You know, this war is getting very expensive in Iraq. I don't have any idea right now how much money they have spent on it because you hear all sorts of figures tossed around. But it's obviously well over $100 billion, and it's probably closer to $200 billion. Plus, there are all sorts of expenses that don't get counted when figures are given. In other words, they will give you the costs uh, that are actually spent getting soldiers to Iraq on their salaries and the equipment they have and so on, and probably very little is spent on the training, uh, pardon me, very little of what is spent on things like training camps in the United States and all sorts of support in the Pentagon and other places don't get counted into the total that they give you. But it's into the hundreds of billions of dollars. There's no question about that. So let's talk about finance and economics. If you really had an intelligent course in such a thing, one of the first things they would tell you is that when emergencies come up, if you do not have money set aside for those emergencies, then you obviously have no choice but to cut down on other things that you normally spend money on, that you just simply cannot afford those things. You can't go to the movies as often. You can't eat out as often. You can't buy that new car you had planned to buy this year because of the emergency that has come up. And obviously, the federal government has no money set aside for emergencies. It is about $7 trillion in debt. And if you're $7 trillion in debt, you don't have a slush fund of any kind. So what is the Congress doing when it has to spend this extra money on the war, large amounts of extra money on the war? What is it cutting back on? It is cutting back on nothing. It is continuing to spend like 535 drunken sailors, 534. Pardon me, I won't count Ron Paul and the drunken sailors. They are continuing to spend on the most god-awful things. And I'll give you one example. In Alaska, the federal government is building a bridge for the folks of Ketchikan, Alaska. The bridge is a mile long. It has a clearance of 200 feet from the water, which makes it 80 feet higher than the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's only 20 feet less as long as the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Those bridges, the Brooklyn Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge, actually serve millions of people every year who cross those bridges. This bridge in Ketchikan, which the Congress is going to go ahead and spend on anyway, will cost $200 million. It is going to connect a village of 7,845 people. It's going to connect those people to an island that has 50 people on it. So all told, 7,895 people might be affected, might use this bridge. And it's going to cost $200 million. That's pretty bad. Oh, 
wait. But as Ron Popeil in his infomercials would say, there's more. There's another bridge in Alaska, this one connecting Anchorage to a port about two miles away. And that port has a single regular tenant. This two-mile-long bridge is expected to cost as much as $2 billion. $2 billion. The chief sponsors of these bridges are Senator Thad Stevens, Ted Stevens of Alaska and Representative Don Young of Alaska. Gee, that's a coincidence. Both of them are from Alaska, and that's where the bridges are. Neither of them is the least bit apologetic about it. In fact, uh, Senator Stevens was quoted in the New York Times as saying, I'd like to be a little onkier myself, meaning he'd like to spend even more money on pork than he has been up to now. It's amazing. And you know that George Bush is not going to veto this bill when it gets onto his desk. He doesn't veto bills. And as somebody wrote about this, uh, Lynn Woolley in a an internet website called Belogical.com, quote, there comes a point when you begin to wonder about the patriotism of those members of Congress who would waste our money in such a manner. We are fighting a war supposedly for the very existence of Western civilization and our way of life. We are trying to pull the country out of a recession. We are seeing a return to big deficits. Yet senators and congressmen take spiteful glee in wasting billions of dollars confiscated from taxpayers across the country. That's your tax dollars at work. Those are the people who are going to teach our children about personal finance and economics. Let's now go to the telephones and start by going to Fort Collins, Colorado, to speak with Jan. Good evening, Jan. Good evening. Your uh, your story about the Alaskan Ridge is uh, quite impressive. I say uh, let's uh, throw the current bums out and replace them all with libertarians. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, I think we're a little ways away from there, but <laughs> it's nice to dream. Yeah. One one problem that I found when I talk to people about voting for libertarian candidates is that they feel that they have to vote for one of the major parties in order to keep the other one from not getting in. Uh, it's the old uh, wasted vote uh, problem, the spoiler problem. It's called by various names. Yes. But... Uh, uh, one thing that I've uh, heard about recently, and I'm, I'm rather excited about it, is uh, an idea called Vote Buddies. Um, what that amounts to is that, let's, let's say that you want to vote for a libertarian candidate, but uh, you feel compelled to vote for, uh, let's say, Bush. If you know someone that wants to vote for a the same candidate or another third-party candidate, but feels that he's compelled to vote for a Kerry, then what you do is you get together with that person, and you each agree not to vote for either of the major two part, party candidates. Mm -hmm. And now you can vote for your, your third party candidate, and he can vote for his uh, alternative party candidate. Well, would you trust somebody who says he's going to vote for Ralph Nader? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I give him a 50-50 chance of uh, voting for Nader instead of uh, Kerry. Well, it really doesn't matter, even if he goes back on his word and votes for Kerry. The fact of the matter is that you're voting your conscience. You're voting for what you want, and you don't need somebody else to vote for it. Uh, it's, it's interesting. You can approach this one of two ways. Either your vote makes a difference or it doesn't. If your vote doesn't make a difference, if it's not going to be decisive in the outcome of the election, then it doesn't really matter who you vote for. So you certainly ought to vote for the person you really want so that you get an emotional release from it and you don't have to take a shower after going to the voting booth. But on the other hand, if your vote could possibly make a difference, then it's an even greater reason to vote for what you want because whomever you elect by your decisive vote, you are, in effect, endorsing what that person is promoting. If you vote for George Bush and he wins because of your vote, you have told him you think it's just dandy that he's taking the country into war. You think it's just dandy that he's signing every bill that comes from Congress. You think it's just dandy that he wants the federal government to become involved in uh, private schools with vouchers and religious charities through his compassionate conservative program. And on the other hand, if you vote for Kerry and yours is the decisive vote that gets him in, then you're saying you're all in favor of universal health care and you're all in favor of expanding the uh, American military presence in Iraq. You're all in favor of all the other things that uh, John Kerry is promoting and he's going to feel free to go ahead and do these things now because you have told him, you the decisive vote, have told him that you agree with what he wants. Now that may not be what you're thinking. You may have been voting because you voting for this person because you were scared to death of the other person, but that's not the way it's going to be accepted. So my point is that whether you think your vote is decisive or you don't think your vote is decisive, you, it still makes sense to only vote for what you want because you just might get what you ask for, and if you do, then you're going to be in real trouble if you've asked for the wrong thing. Well, I, I certainly agree with you, but uh, I'm, I'm a, a, a true believer uh, third-party type. Um, they, the problem is that there are people who just you know, they, they, they simply can't get that idea to themselves, they, to, their, to their heads at all. Well, most people are not going to get the idea the first time you present it to them. You have to realize that 
all of us learned gradually over a period of time whatever it is that we believe today. And other people are the same way. And just the fact that you haven't turned somebody around with one compelling statement doesn't mean that that person is a lost cause. You just you have to be benevolent. You have to be sympathetic. And you have to realize that these people want the same thing that you and I want, and that is to be able to make their own decisions and not have somebody making all their decisions for them. And if we just be patient and just work with these people in a non-offensive, non-hostile, non-aggressive, non-confrontational way, we are going to have good luck over a period of time converting some of them, not all of them, but some of them. No salesman sells every prospect that he comes across. Well, this, this seems like the, just one more tool in, in, in our arsenal. I mean, mm-hmm. when, when we meet people that, that say, well, I, I, I agree with, you know, I agree that this is a, a good guy to uh, vote for, but uh, I, I just have to vote for Kerry or I just have to vote for Bush, then it's, it's something you can, uh, you know, pull out of your pocket and, and say, okay, uh, I understand what you're saying, uh, but uh, I can hook you up with someone that wants to vote for the other guy, and now you guys can cancel each other's vote, each other's vote <laughs> and vote for who you really want to. Right. So uh. there's, there's, a, uh, there's a website. Uh, it's just votebuddy.org, uh, which, which talks about this concept, and uh, I invite people to uh, go there, uh, look it over, and uh, promote the idea. Votebuddy.com or org? org. Yeah. Wh- which did you say, com or org? Uh, I think it's both, actually. Okay. Votebuddy.com or votebuddy.org. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thanks for calling, Jan. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And before we go on, let me just take a little uh, diversion here because we're really talking about something very important, and that is that it has reached the point today where it's not hard to assume that most people are not voting for what they want, but voting against what they're afraid of. We have reached the point where Democrats and Republicans are so bitter and so confrontational that they just simply will not accept anything that might seem to be favorable to the other side. And a good example of this is the charges of lying that are going around. You know, Joseph Wilson was the former ambassador who went to Niger for the CIA to see if Saddam Hussein was really buying enriched uranium from the Nigerian uh, mines there run by the government, and uh, came back and reported to the CIA that there was no such thing, and yet, even after he had come back from that, George Bush put in his State of the Union speech in 2003 about the Iraqi government buying enriched uranium from Niger. Then, when Wilson, in the summer of 2003, wrote an article for the New York Times telling that he had gone and investigated this for the CIA and reported back that there was no such sales going on, uh, then all hell broke loose. The next thing that happened was Wilson's wife was outed as a CIA agent. Somebody in the Bush administration leaked to journalist Robert Novak that Wilson's wife was a CIA agent named uh, Valerie Plame, P-L-A-M-E. And so that became the cause celebre, and Bush promised to look into it and find out who leaked and this, that, and the other thing. And, of course, nothing has happened. But uh, then something came up about the question. It was uh, Valerie Plum, the one who recommended her husband to go to Niger on this little errand for the CIA? And Wilson said, no, my wife did not uh, recommend me. She was not the person who did so. And then somebody else came out and said, we have it on authoritative evidence that his wife was the one who recommended him for the job of going to Niger. So now conservatives say, and you can see it on a lot of conservative uh, websites, that Joseph Wilson has been discredited, as if all the stuff about Niger and the enriched uranium and everything is obviously a pack of lies because Joseph Wilson presumably said that his wife did not recommend him for the job, and in fact she did. Well, I don't know whether or not she did, but it has nothing to do with the other. Now, my point is that people on both sides, liberals and conservatives, leap at any opportunity to call somebody on the other side a liar, to call somebody discredited. Look at the vituperation that Michael Moore is getting for his uh, movie on uh, uh, 9-11. And I'm sure that there are things in Michael Moore's movie that don't quite add up, and certainly his underlying belief that government is our protector, that government should be huge and take care of all the poor children in the land and educate everybody and take care of our health care, that that probably permeates in the movie in uh, some ways uh, and I would think distorts the message somewhat. But the fact of the matter is that there must be a great deal in that movie about uh, the response to 9-11, which is the point of the movie, and there must be a, lot, a great deal in there that must be true and should be considered on its own merits. But instead, it is just Michael Moore, the liar. And it goes on both sides. But, of course, right now, because conservatives are in control, both in the House and the Senate and in the White House, we are getting more attacks on liberals than we are on conservatives. It's interesting. A few years ago, I was on Larry Elder's show in Los Angeles. Larry Elder is a very popular talk show host in Los Angeles, somebody I admire very much because he's a very good talk show host. And he even joined the Libertarian Party, but then left when the war started because he believes very strongly in the war. And libertarians diverged from his view. But several years ago, before 9-11, and in fact before Bush was elected president, 
when I was on his show and in his studio during a commercial break when we were off the air, Elder brought up the fact that liberals were much meaner than conservatives, that conservatives would disagree what liberals said, but liberals wouldn't just disagree. They would call conservatives immoral, uh, heartless, uh, evil, so forth and so on, and go on and on and on about that, and that they couldn't just simply say, I don't agree with you. I think you're wrong about this, and here are my reasons. They, in other words, had to demonize conservatives. I haven't seen or talked with Larry Elder in several years now, but I would be interested in getting his opinion on that same subject today. Because now that conservatives are running the country in control of the government, and now that conservatives have the, the people on their side generally on issues of war and terrorism and so forth, they are the ones who are demonizing the opposition. They are the ones who are calling the opposition evil, anti-American, pro-Hussein, so forth and so on. And you can just come up with example after example after example. I read one earlier today where somebody pointed out that uh, the French had refused to, to join Reagan when Reagan was going to bomb Libya. The French refused to join in on it, and the writer pointed out that this showed that the French were pro-Arab and anti-American. No, they just didn't want to bomb somebody, but that's the way it has become now, and there is no intelligent discourse. My point about demonizing the opposition is that this is the only way, it seems, that people in the major parties can get votes these days. The Republicans have to demonize the Democrats. They have to scare people to death. You may not feel like voting, but if you don't vote, John Kerry will get in, and this country will be run by the liberal elites, and we will have all kinds of terrible things happen. Uh, we will have drugs and prostitution and God knows what else. And, of course, if you're a Democrat and you don't feel that inspired about John Kerry, then they will go on and on and on about George Bush and the terrible man he is and the, the liar and so forth and so on. And as a result, if you don't vote for George Bush and uh, and keep those Republicans out of office, then what's going to happen is that corporate America is going to take over the country and so on, and people are going to die in the streets from poverty and hunger and the whole works. So this is the way they work, and this is why the wasted vote concept exists, not because you're afraid of voting libertarian because you really want, say, George Bush to be elected, but rather because you're scared to death that if you vote libertarian, you might help elect John Kerry. And of course, if you're on the liberal side of the fence, then if you vote for Ralph Nader, you might help elect George Bush. And God, I think how terrible that would be. Well, the matter, the truth of the matter is that it doesn't matter whether George Bush or John Kerry is elected. You're not going to notice that much difference except in the speaking style, and both of them are terrible speakers. All right, let's talk with Joe in Norfolk, uh, Virginia. Good evening, Joe. You with us? Yes, I'm with you. Good evening or good morning, depending, uh, Harry. <laughs> right. Uh, thanks so much for hanging on. It's my pleasure. Uh, I agree completely with what you said about uh, Congress and spending and the deficit and acting like 535 drunken sailors, except I think you're being very unfair to drunken sailors. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I never saw a drunken sailor go back into the tavern and steal another beer, or worse yet, have the uh, tavern keeper uh, make up a new tab for him. <laughs> which is which is what we saps uh, do, you know. I mean, it's worse. It's worse. Um, briefly about the George Bush's uh, speaking ability, he reminds me sometimes of an old comic, uh, a double talk routine specialist named Al Kelly. And I don't know if you ever saw him or heard of him. That name doesn't ring a bell. Was he like Norm Cosby? Norm uh, Crosby? But better. Really? Even better. He was on candid camera uh, very often years ago, and he would get up in front of judges or policemen. They'd have a candid camera on him, and loads of gibberish would come out of his mouth. <laughs> and people would stand there nodding their heads and saying, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. And, he said this man wise. But see, he knew, and we knew, that everything coming out of his mouth was gibberish, but he were fooling people because people listen, and but they're not listening. They're just waiting to speak, you know. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, when George Bush speaks, he believes what he says has meaning and substance, and the people who are listening, of course, believe that as well. But... Um, I think he's on the same kind of a level as Al Kelly in many respects. It's gibberish. It really is. Even though it's hard to understand many times, uh, the words, the actual words, if you put them together and try to get some syntax out of them, the proper syntax, they really don't make sense anyway. Yes, and these are, in most cases, pre-written speeches. He's not <laughs> speaking off the cuff. Uh, he's he's uh, working from a teleprompter or something else, and still uh, the syntax is garbled at times. And, of course, sometimes he reads something off the uh, teleprompter and it suddenly hits him, hey, you know, that's a good idea, and he has to repeat it for the benefit of the audience. He's really repeating it for himself. He's saying, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, we're going to give everybody a card, or whatever it is, and it really is a sight to behold. But you know what? All these people cheering George Bush at these events, they're not really cheering George Bush. They're booing the Democrats, only they do it by cheering George Bush. They're saying, thank God, whoever you are, however stupid you may appear at times, thank goodness you have saved us from the Democrats. Joe, I'm sorry to rush you. If you have anything else to say, just hang on through the news, and we will continue thank this you, conversation. Right. Joe, you still with us? Yes, thanks for holding me over. I'll be I'll be as brief as I possibly can, uh, Harry. Um, you know, uh, the Libertarian Party just nominated its presidential candidate, and then he went to the witness protection program, I guess. 
unfortunately. <laughs> well, you know, even though... That's, that's what libertarian candidates do. Well, even though you ran, and I mean this from the heart, seriously, and I've been a fan of yours since 96, when I first became aware of you, you ran two wonderful campaigns, and I saw you speak here in Norfolk. It was in an old um, um, uh, funeral parlor, as a matter of fact, which, <laughs> you know, but uh, you were just a wonderful speaker, and uh, you didn't have any money, but you managed to get your head above the water, and you were on Bill Maher, and you made appearances. But more often than not, the Libertarian Party candidate uh, disappears. Now, this is interesting because I think I... Um, I think this year they're going to be, the party's going to have the candidate on the ballot in 49, if not all 50 states, as it was during your two runs. Is that not correct? I'm not sure what the ballot access status is right now this year. In my case, it was 50 states in 96 and 49 states in 2000. Well, you know, here, and, and I've read this, and I don't know it to be absolutely true, but I've read this, that the party will be on almost all 50 states, if yes, not all 50 if, states. if it isn't on 50, it'll be very close to it. There's Nader, no question about that. Ralph Nader, who is Ralph Nader, star, <laughs> uh, is going to have trouble making half the states. Um, the Green Party, who has, had, who has had Ralph Nader as their candidate twice and has been around for a while, is going to have trouble making a lot of the states. Um, my question is, what is it with the Libertarian Party that causes it to have so much trouble when it comes to uh, a presidential election time? And I know it's money, but my, my basic question is, where is the Libertarian Michael Moore to popularize our ideas, to get them out there on film and videotape and television? Where is the Libertarian Ralph Nader to write the books and speak on campuses and get notice on television? What is the problem with our party? Well, it's like the old saying, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It is a Which case is not of, true, but go ahead. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not true, but uh, that's what happens in this case in that Ralph Nader is already a celebrity, and he will be treated as a celebrity uh, no matter whether he's going to be on five states or 50 states. And Michael Badnerick or Harry Brown or any other libertarian candidate is not a celebrity, and so he will not be taken seriously. But even Nader will not be taken nearly as seriously as Kerry or Bush because nobody really believes that there's any chance in the world that Ralph Nader can win the presidency. And so we have what I have so often referred to as the one obligatory interview. Almost any media out outlet in the country will give a third party candidate one interview but nobody is going to follow that candidate around and report on him daily the way the various uh, reporters follow John Kerry and George Bush around and so you just have to make the most of that one obligatory interview I was fortunate in the year 2000 and in, uh, to a lesser extent in 96 that a lot of the places where I appeared were glad to have me back a second third fourth time I was on Fox News an awful lot I was on Hannity and Combs I guess five or six times during the campaign and also on the Fox News broadcast a number of times and of course I was on C-SPAN, oh, six, eight, or ten times during the course of the campaign. And so we did get a lot of repeat uh, performances. But places like Meet the Press and, and newscasts and so on, that was just not in the cards because nobody takes you seriously because you're not one of the rich in the sense of one of the, the anointed kind who are who really have a chance to win the election. One, one of the terrible things about this whole situation is the way it manifests itself in that the left, now, Michael Moore, Ralph Nader, and the people who believe in big government, uh, seriously, serious big government, are, are hijacking the anti-war movement. I've often thought if the Libertarian Party had been founded in 1966 during the height of the Vietnam War in 1968 and had run candidates rather than in 1971, it would have been a force uh, because radicalism, and listen, we're radicals for capitalism. Radicalism was taken seriously back in those days. The Libertarian Party, in my opinion, and maybe they're doing this. Maybe I'm not paying close enough attention. Should be running as the anti-war party, and, and this time around, we've got to put the other things aside. Well, I agree with you. If I were running this time, I'm sure that every interview would be probably 40 to 50 percent about the war. It has to be more than that, because otherwise you will be thrown in the pot with Michael Moore and the other people and assume that. And we have to take the opportunity to make the point that the reason that our government got into this war is because it's a big government. A small government could never have uh, undertaken such a thing as to go over and attack Afghanistan and attack Iraq. Not that it might not have been able to beat them, uh, even if it were a lot smaller, but it wouldn't have the resources to be able to divert to that. When you've got a $2 trillion government, you can always find 100 or $200 billion to go fight a war. But when you've got a $50 billion government, you can't just go out and suddenly put 150,000 soldiers in the Middle East. And uh, so we have to, to make the point that it is big government that is a problem, and war is the biggest government problem of all, and the government program of all. And I think that that's what a libertarian candidate needs to do, and I hope that Michael Badnerick will do that. Listen, Harry, thank you so much, and I'm going to stay up late Saturday night to, uh, from now on, even though my old body can't take it, and it's a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure, Joe. Thanks so much for the call. Uh, we were talking earlier before the news break about the fact that Republicans and Democrats get votes by demonizing their opponents. And Sean Hannity, the conservative par excellence, has written a book called Deliver Us from Evil. And there's a wonderful review of it by Lawrence Vance on the LouRockwell.com website. And I have linked to that on the Radio Links page. And you can read this review. And I just point out that Vance says in his review 
that the word evil just appears over and over and over and over again in the book, 42 times in chapter 1, 51 times in chapter 2. And he gives examples of all the things in the world that are evil to Sean Hannity. In chapter 4, Jimmy Carter is evil. Bill Clinton is evil. Saddam Hussein is evil. The Ayatollah Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini is evil. The Democratic Party is evil. Ramsey Clark is evil. In chapter 5, Bill Clinton is evil. Muhammad, Muhammad Gaddafi is evil. John Kerry is evil. The Democratic Party is evil. The Iraqi regime is evil. Yasser Arafat is evil. Al Gore is evil. The Tar- Taliban is evil. And France is evil. In chapter 6, Noam Chomsky is evil. Anti-war protesters are evil. Saddam Hussein is evil. Bill Clinton is evil. Martin Sheen is evil. Richard Gear is evil. Sean Penn is evil. Edward Kennedy is evil. Marcy Captur is evil. And Dennis Kucinich is evil. And on and on it goes. And this is, again, the point that Sean Hannity can't say, I disagree with these people. I think they're misinformed, or I think that they have not thought this out. He has to call them evil. They are a threat to America. If we don't do something to stop these people, America is going to collapse. And this is the way politics goes. It is not that George Bush is a good guy. You've you got to vote for George Bush because John Kerry is evil, because John Kerry will deliver us into evil. And if you are a Democrat or a liberal, you don't vote for John Kerry because he's a masterful statesman, that he puts his country above all, and that he has wonderful ideas to take care of all of the problems facing America today. No, you have to vote for John Kerry because George Bush is evil. And if we don't get George Bush out of the White House, we are going to have evil personified throughout America. And this is the way politics goes. They do not encourage you to vote for anybody. They encourage you to vote against people. That's why there's so much negative advertising. Let's talk now with Matt in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Good evening, Matt. Hey, how you doing, Harry? Just fine. What's up? No, not much. I'm just, I saw you in Tallahassee in 2000. I was a freshman at Florida State. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And uh, it's good to talk to you now. I wanted to talk about, briefly, uh, voting third party. Um, I, so I disagree with a lot of people that say that you, know, you shouldn't do it because you're just going to put the bad guy into office. When uh, reality, I think that voting for the third party, whether it be the Greens or the Libertarians or whomever, uh, you're hopefully getting that party that much closer to, you know, well, one, getting the word out, and B, getting uh, matching funds eventually, assuming that the Republicans and Democrats don't collude again to up the, uh, up the ante on that. Well, uh, first of all, with regard to the matching funds, I did qualify for matching funds in 96 yeah. and 2000. And, of course, I would not take them because I don't believe in welfare for individuals. I don't believe in welfare for corporations. And I certainly don't believe in it for politicians. But with regard to uh, trying to encourage people to vote to, to bring a third party up, they have to first want that the third party become more prominent. And so it really doesn't do much good to talk to somebody about voting libertarian until they want a libertarian America, until they want to see the income tax repealed, until they want to see uh, our foreign policy change so that we're not continually running around the world getting involved in other people's problems. They want to see Social Security taken out of the hands of the government, and they want to see an end of the war on drugs. Then you really are in a position to bear down and say, well, you're never going to get that as long as you vote Republican and Democrat because you're telling them just to keep on with the same policies, and that's exactly what they'll do, and that's exactly the way they will interpret your vote. But the first step, of course, is to make people want a better America, make people uh, see that there are ways by which things could be vastly different from the way they are now. And, and, of course, as I've said before, it doesn't do any good to talk about small incremental increases because that doesn't make you that much different from the Republicans and Democrats. And since they're the ones that have a chance to win, there's no point in getting excited about somebody other than the Republicans or Democrats. So we don't talk about a 10 percent tax uh, cut. We talk about getting rid of the income tax entirely and the $10,000 a year that that will probably mean to your family. We talk about getting the government completely out of Social Security so every dollar you earn is yours to do with as you see fit and end the war on drugs so that we make a significant difference in crime rather than just making some little baby step uh, like uh, medical marijuana or something else or changing the mandatory minimum uh, law or some little cosmetic change, but rather make a wholesale difference. And only the libertarians are offering that, so only the libertarians are the ones to join up with if those are things that really inspire you and think will make a difference in America. So we've got to talk big. We've got to talk about big changes and not little ones if we ever want people to abandon the two major parties and come over to us. Well, certainly, and I, I would speak uh, to the people that feel that way, uh, that feel that big changes are in order, but that feel that they need to compromise themselves to vote for either Bush or for Kerry, uh, you know, because it's the lesser of two evils. Right, well, where has compromise gotten them? Just well, exactly. bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger government. Oh, my. You know, today I was thinking, and I think I've mentioned this before on the show, but I was just thinking about Barry Goldwater's speech. He was elected in 1958 for the first time to the U.S. Senate, and in 1959, he made his maiden speech on the floor of the Senate, as they say, and that speech was denouncing the Eisenhower administration. Goldwater was a Republican, Eisenhower was a Republican, but that speech was denouncing and condemning the Eisenhower administration for this gigantic budget that Eisenhower was submitting to Congress for the fiscal year 1960. This horrendous budget that was just so outsized and so ridiculously, absurdly large. That budget was $80 billion. And today, of course, the federal budget is $2.4 trillion, 30 times the size. But 
that $80 billion budget was a sign of terror, horror, and so on for people who believed in limited government. And all the compromising, all the going along, all the trying to get more conservatives elected, uh, all the trying to influence the Republicans or influence the Democrats, all of this and that, what has it gotten us? It has gotten us a budget that is 30 times as great as the budget of 1959. So anyway, thanks so much, Matt, for your call. I appreciate it. And let us now talk with Al in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Good evening, Al. Good evening, Harry. It's an honor and pleasure to speak to you. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're with us. What's up? Uh, not much. Actually, I have a lot in common with your last caller. I attended Florida State at one point, and I now live in New Mexico. Um, I think you had a very good point about voting principle, and I actually called into another talk show and castigated that host for not voting principle. He's going to vote for John Kerry, and I think he's selling out on his principle. This is Alan Combs. I'm and sorry, you, you said he, you think he's selling out on principle what? Uh, I think he's selling out on his principles by voting for Kerry because there are I a lot see. of places where he disagrees with Kerry, but he thinks that the Democrats have a better platform than the Republicans, so he's going to make his party rather than principle. Mm-hmm. So I think that's just uh, epidemic here, and um, it's just uh, it's ridiculous. I just wish people would, would vote principle rather than party, you know, rather than the lesser of two evils, or you make the point that you're still voting for evil, you're voting for the lesser of two evils. Yes, the winner-take-all system with no runoff and no uh, voting by rank or any of the other methods that might give third parties more influence. Uh, this system of winner-take-all, of course, encourages the idea that there's really only two possibilities, and you better vote against the one that would you think would be the most disastrous. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. But you, you just have to keep doing what you're doing. I'll call into talk shows and make these points. And, and as I said earlier, nobody's going to be convinced with one shot. But if you do it and other people do it, and maybe you do it again and so on, some people get the point. And I can't tell you how many people have told me that the first time I heard you say something, I couldn't agree with you at all. But the more I thought about it and the more times that this was brought to my attention by you or somebody else, the more I began to realize that there is a lot of sense to this, and now I am completely on your side on this, that, and the other thing, whatever it may be. And I've been hearing this for many, many years. And right. it is, isn't my persuasive powers. It's, a, it's the fact that we have the strongest argument of all, and that is we want you to be able to live your life as you want to live it. And there just are no Democrats or Republicans, no matter what they say at election time, there are none who are going to offer you that same privilege. And so, Hello. beg pardon? Well, except for Ron Paul, always except for Ron Paul. Right. And, uh, and uh, so the point is that we have this enormous argument on uh, we are the, the ones who really have the, the people on our side or we are the ones that are on the people's side. So it just takes repetition. And the first time people hear it, it doesn't really matter whether they agree with you. You just seem to have no opportunity to be able to do anything about it anyway, so they tend not to take you seriously. But the more they hear it, the more they either become a believer that it could happen, or the more they feel, boy, this is something that's got to happen, no matter how long the shot is against it. So it really does take repetition, and what we need to do is to just uh, expose these ideas to people wherever we can. Uh, write a letter to the editor, put a put a note on a blog, uh, on a conservative or a liberal website, uh, call into talk shows, even though they are conservative talk shows or libertarian talk shows, and make your point. Make it as pleasantly and as unruffled as possible, no matter what kind of a reaction you get. That's good advice. Uh, and I was reading something by Pete that P.J. O'Rourke wrote, and it's the case for voter control. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, in his, in his very funny way of, uh, you know, no one's arguing for the, for, uh, to take away the right to vote, just certain votes, like assault votes, intended to hurt people. And I think if you took away assault votes, no <laughs> yeah, we see Right. A hundred votes would win the election then. <laughs> that would be about it. Um, yeah. So I thought that was a very good point. Also, likening to gun control is very, very funny. Um, and if I may, uh, Harry, I just tell you that I'm a re- recovering Republican, and you are one who turned me around here. Um, I actually thought in 2002, if the Republicans took control of both houses, everything was going to go great. It's just had the opposite effect. Mm-hmm. Government's so bloated now, much more so than even under the Clinton years. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for divided government. There's no question about that. Well, just remember how you came around. It didn't all happen overnight. It took a... Uh, uh, a steady stream of ideas being presented to you and possibilities and so on, and look at other people in the same way and just encourage them to take one little step forward and another step forward and another step. Mm-hmm. Al, thanks so much for calling. I appreciate Thank you, Harry. your it's insights. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. All right. Now let's just move from New Mexico right on over to Arizona and talk with John, who's in Tucson. Um, you're in the beginning of the story talking about the waste of money, and maybe this didn't hit your computer screen or, or whatever. <laughs> uh, of course, the border is a big issue down here. Mm-hmm. Uh, starting earlier this month and continuing through the end of September, the Border Patrol, along with whatever agency, immigration, and all them folks, uh, if you're an illegal immigrant coming into this country and you're caught, you now have the option to um, get a free plane ride to either Mexico City or Guadalajara, and this is costing uh, $18 million uh, through September. It's for a three-month program, at least. And one of the fellows who is... Uh, getting on the plane was quoted as saying, well, we 
he's coming back to get another free year. Old trip, <laughs> right, trip, right. Plane trip. I love that airline food. <laughs> well, and it's, it's basically a subsidy to using Mexican on the airlines. And uh, they're also using these unmanned drones that they use in Iraq and other places. Um, I don't know what the cost of that is. What, what do they use the drones for? Patrol the border and use infrared technology to find uh, illegals coming across the border. Mm. And they, it was some insignificant figure, like maybe they've caught 30 people. Uh, I don't know what the cost of this program. They're running Black Hawk helicopters. It's, it's, it's a, practically a military operation. It's not, in, in fact, it is a de facto military operation um, with, you know, security guards with binoculars and, and uh, infrared detectors. And, uh, you know, I don't know what, what they hope to accomplish. They, no matter what they do, the people still keep coming. Oh, that's the point. The, you are right on the point there. It doesn't matter how much money they spend. It doesn't matter what new laws are passed. It doesn't matter what they say they're going to do. No. The people will still keep coming across the border as long as we have a giant welfare state here, which is much, much more generous than the welfare state in Mexico. And it is just like trying to stop drugs. It is like trying to do anything else to bring democracy to Iraq or anyplace else. Mm -hmm. Government simply doesn't work. And every program to stamp out illegal immigration turns out to hurt the innocent far more than the so-called guilty and the innocent are going to get hurt by having to carry id cards by having uh, constant inspections of uh, places of business in the border areas and these inspections are going to cost heavily not just in tax money but cost the businesses themselves heavily which is going to depress wages in those businesses and it's going to depress profits and it's, it's going to hurt america and so it is just stupid no i shouldn't say stupid but foolish right. to think that government is going to solve any problem even if it's a problem you think must be solved we know that we don't want government in health care because we know it's bad but we think it would be good if we stopped illegal immigration or if we got rid of bad dictators around the world. But it doesn't matter if it's a good program or a bad program. It still is not going to work, and it's still going to cost far more than they told us it was going to cost, and it will still lead to all kinds of consequences that nobody considered in Congress at the time that they passed it. So well, you, you really hit your uh, hit the nail on yeah, the head. There's, there's other crazy things going on at, at the border as well uh, regarding uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, there are laws in Mexico uh, most Americans aren't even aware of, and they just started, like, really enforcing them. There was a man who came from Phoenix to Nogales uh, to purchase some Valium for his wife. He's 66 years old. He was approached by uh, an undercover Mexican policeman. He had 270 Valium pills, and he was facing up to five years in prison. In Mexican prison? Mexican prison. And he was in Mexican prison waiting a trial. Uh, he did was released after, like, 56 days. I don't know what prompted them to, to do that. Well, was it against the law for him to buy these pills in Mexico, against Mexican law? Well, the law is, as I understand it, you need a, a doctor from America prescription, and you need a prescription from a Mexican doctor to buy the, the drugs. And you need the American doctor prescription in order to get back across the border. And if you don't have all that, you're, you could be arrested. I see. Uh, and so um, all this bad publicity has depressed the uh, business at the pharmacies in Nogales by about 80%. Uh, people are afraid to step foot across the border now, where there is a thriving. Uh, they don't even want to go and get penicillin or anything, even though that does not fall under the same category. Mm -hmm. These controlled substances like Valium, Xanax, and, and uh, OxyContin, things like that. Uh, and you you cannot bring more than a 90-day supply. If you do, you're considered a trafficker. And so, um, it just this particular case was very high profile. And uh, so everybody, the, all the pharmacies in Mexico, or at least Nogales, have lost a huge amount of business. And it's depressing the economy of Nogales in general because people aren't going across the border anymore. Uh, the, there are parking lots on this side of the border who are normally full, and they're like 80 or 90 percent empty now. Hmm. So. Well, that's interesting. When I was in the Army, Nogales was just known as a place of prostitution. <laughs> and I guess the penicillin business was an outgrowth of that. But now it's a place to go and buy prescription drugs. Well, people are trying to save money. And, sure. Um, because it is significantly cheaper in, in many instances. Uh, in order for, for me as an American to buy a, a penicillin or whatever, that category, if I want it for my dog, uh, which some people do that for the, their dog medicine across the border, um, nobody cares. But if I wanted to go to, to buy penicillin in the United States, I need to see a doctor, spend my time waiting in the doctor's office and uh, convincing him that I need whatever drug. Sure. And in Mexico, it's I don't know if it's actually over-the-counter, but uh, in some ways they have a lot more drug freedom. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very, very much for your call, John. I appreciate it okay. and uh, bringing us up to date on what's going on there. And uh, we are about to take another break. And when we come back, we'll have uh, one last call and then a few closing words. And uh, before we go, just uh, a nice 
Email from Sean says, I honestly believe that the libertarians' biggest issue should be education. As long as government runs the schools, they will teach our children that we need big government to survive. Before we take our last call, uh, some quick emails. Joe out in cyberspace called my attention to the fact that Barry Goldwater was not first elected to the Senate in 1958, but rather in 1952. And I checked during the break, and Joe is absolutely right. It was 52. So I don't know whether he made that speech I referred to in 1953 or 59. It apparently would have been 1959 because that's when the budget was around $80 billion. And in 53, it would have been less than that. And so it wasn't his maiden speech as I thought it was, just a very famous speech at the time. Bob asks if I am providing any advice to American candidate Richard Mack in his quest for the Showtime presidency. I don't know Richard Mack, and I haven't heard from him, so no, I'm not providing any advice, but I would be glad to if he asked for it, I guess. Uh, Of course, what we're talking about here is the Showtime series called The American Presidency, where they have uh, picked some people to run for the presidency you know, in a fictitious way. And one of them is a libertarian who was running for governor of some western state and decided not to run when he qualified for the Showtime series. Joshua says, I'm curious about the libertarian slash Brown view of the ACLU. To what extent do you agree or disagree with their views and actions and lawsuits? Do you believe they help or hurt the message of freedom? Well, they certainly help the message of freedom in the area of civil rights, meaning freedom of speech and assembly and religion and so forth. Uh, But they do not show much interest in the rest of the Constitution, not even the Second Amendment, for example. And this is not surprising, but I think in the area that they do concentrate on the most, that they are do much more good than harm. But of course, the ACLU is what they call a bête noir of the right. You know, the ACLU is evil, one of Sean Hannity's list of evil people. Roger in Clymer, New York, is on the phone. And, Roger, I, we're just about running out of time because I'm so long-winded. Have you got something brief to tell us tonight? Yeah, I sent you an email. Um, it was on the 9-11 report. If you go up to the um, frontpagemagazine.com, the guy's got an article there on how Iran is now our new threat. Yes, there has been a lot of little things just kind of dribbled out from the administration about how we've got to do something about Iran before it's too late, and whether that's going to come about, you know, come to a head before the election or not uh, remains to be seen. And the beauty of it is, is you know, Iran wouldn't be a threat if we weren't over in Iraq. Of course. Uh, but let's not get in our logic into anything like, you know, anything like this. <laughs> of course not. Also, it was rather funny. It was in the uh, Erie paper uh, the other day. I saved it as a PDF file. Oh, we're so grateful. The federal government has released money from the Homeland Security budget, and now we can buy all these additional things that we need in case, like, say, oh, a building you know, gets blown up and, you know, someone can, you know, whatever. You mean uh, money to replace the building? or yeah, well, no, 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 this is equipment to help people that, you know, could be trapped in the building. Oh, I that, see. You know. But the beauty of it is, is, isn't it wonderful that the federal government gives us this money to do these things when it's the federal government who's responsible for it in the first place? because of their meddling in other people's affairs overseas. Of course. We have become an armed state, and there is no end in sight of it. There is nothing that President Bush can say or John Kerry can say or any other politician can say that all we have to do is X, Y, and Z, and we will be able to release all of this money that's going into the war on terrorism. We will be able to restore the airports to their state that they were before 9-11. We will be able to go back to living like a free country again. No. What we have is the prospect of living like this in a state of siege for the rest of our lives, and I'm determined that we're going to do something to stop this. Thanks so much for your call. Roger, and thank you for listening to the show tonight. We'll be here again next Saturday night at this time with our last show on the Radio America Network, and in celebration of that, we'll have bands and banners and uh, all kinds of things, so please do tune in. This is Harry Brown. Have a good week. Good night.